appreciate that. You know, I know we're not a perfect nation, but I truly uh, echo those sentiments that I'm proud to be American. I'm not ashamed of our flag. I, I honor our flag, the United States of America. But the song that you just heard is so fitting to the text that I want to preach from this morning. So turn with me to Luke and the ninth chapter. Luke and the ninth chapter. We get asked a lot of questions. Probably in recent times, we get asked some similar questions that we even anticipate at times. I've had this question asked of me multiple times, never uh, uh, was bothered by being asked this, but many people have asked me, when are we going to get back to our regular weekly schedule here at First Southern? Um, And my most common answer is, I don't know. Now, an I don't know answer probably frustrates more people than any other answer that I could possibly give because I know that people are looking at schedules and things like that. For Southern has been a very busy church. Something's going on almost every single day. And then uh, sometimes, if it's Sunday, all day long sometimes. And so I know that there's a lot of activities. When that got curtailed quite a bit, I also know that it um, is something that a lot of schedules have been messed up. I knew I was going to have problems as soon as Chuck gave me a, 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 a Hall's cough drop this morning. It's the sign that I'm going to have to use this. The only problem is I get excited when I'm preaching and somewhere in the sermon I'll launch it out and I'll give it back to Chuck a little bit smaller than it was when he gave it to me. The other kinds of questions that individuals have to answer, it's like the student that is graduating from high school and they're going to college. I've asked this many times to new students going to the university. What are you going to study? What field? What's going to be your major? What are you going to, what are you going to do? And most of the time, the majority of the time, I get this as the answer. I don't know. <clears throat> All right. Well, I know for some specifics that they're going to have to make a decision sometime, right? I have yet to see a graduate graduate from college with a diploma in I don't know. That just doesn't happen, right? You've got to make a decision. You have to come to a conclusion of sometime somewhere down the line. Well, I want to turn to this text today, and and I want you to think in regards to a question that is asked. And everyone in this room, everyone that's watching this on on a a streaming service or maybe a recorded video of some other time, You're going to answer this question. You are absolutely going to answer this question that I'm going to ask. And it's the very question that Jesus Christ asks. So I just turn it to you to what exactly Jesus says here in these verses. So Luke chapter 9, verse 18 is where I'm going to begin. Because we'll read three verses here. But this is what it says. And it came to pass... As he was alone praying, his disciples were with him, and he asked them, saying, Whom say the people that I am? They answering said, John the Baptist, but some say Elias, which is Elijah, and others say that one of the old prophets is risen again. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Peter answering said, The Christ of God. And he straightway charged them and commanded them to tell no man that thing. I'm going to pause right there. I want you to think about verse 22 in just a moment. But I want you to think about this important question. The seriousness of this question cannot be overestimated. The seriousness of this question 
cannot be set aside. There's a lot of things that we can set aside. Um, I could, you could set aside as a student, you know. Uh, you're starting the university and, and you're saying, well, I don't know what my major is going to be. I don't know what I'm going to focus in, but, but I, I got time to think about it. And I can make that decision later. And that's true. I made the decision of what I was to be and what I was going to be as a sophomore at North High School. At North High School at that time, they offered accounting classes, and I said, I'm going to become an accountant. And I took two years of accounting at North High School before I ever entered the university. So when I entered the university, I uh, said, I'm going to be an accountant. And uh, I took four years of accounting. So I've had six years of study and learning how to be an accountant. That's worked out well, hadn't it? The only person that considers me an accountant is my wife, who says, yeah, you're just really nitty-gritty on that stuff, you know. But I am. Um, You know, this is one of those things that we can put some things off. But this question, you cannot. You cannot. You cannot just say, I'll I'll make that decision later. I'm going to sort of investigate and think about who Jesus is at some other time. I'm going to delay the answer to that. I'm going to do something else in regards to the question that gets asked to me. And I'm going to declare to you, before we even begin the point of the sermon, you cannot do that. You cannot delay this question. You cannot put it off. Because I'm going to state this as clear as I possibly can. Jesus forces us to answer this question. Who do you say that I am? You might say, well, I don't have to answer that right now. Well, let me explain something to you. Not answering is an answer. Okay? Until you say yes to Jesus, you are saying no to Jesus. That needs to be clearly defined. Now, I know I may be speaking to someone this morning that says, you know, well, I haven't said yes to Jesus, I just don't know about certain things, and I'm wrestling with some certain things. And and, and, and as a pastor, I would say to you right away, I understand that. And that's good that you're contemplating this. Maybe you're seeking some answers of who Jesus Christ really is. Maybe you, you want something of further information. We exist as a church to say, let's open the Bible, let's, let's find out what Jesus said, let's see if that's actually who he is and what he said will happen and and all those kinds of things. We can explore that with you. We'd love to do that. We don't don't sort of, you know, put down someone who says, I'm not a Christian, but I'm I'm seeking Christianity. We're, we're We're not saying no to that. I'm just telling you, I want you to understand something up front very quickly. The reality is, if you haven't said yes to Jesus, you are in the present tense saying no to Jesus. And so you are answering that question whether you think you are or not. That's how serious this question is. Now, I don't want to say that to try to manipulate somebody. I'm not trying to pressure someone. I I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't try to get you to do something that you're not really convinced of. That's not what real Christianity is. Some people sort of just go along with the flow of Christianity thinking, okay, now I'm a Christian. When they're not serious about it, and I wouldn't intend that. I don't want you to do that. I don't want you to play the games of church, religion, Christianity. I don't want you to play the games of that. I want you to be serious about it. But please understand, until you say yes to Jesus, you really are saying no to Jesus. Let's look at some points here. I've got five. Let me back up. I didn't read verse 22 here. I want to do that. Saying, Son of Man must suffer many things... And be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be slain and be risen the third day. Now that's significant compared to all the things that Jesus Christ has said. But let's look at these points individually. Number one is this. What do others think? Now you have heard, if you've been here very many Sundays at First Southern, you have heard me say this over and over. It doesn't make any difference what other people think. I've said that probably 50 times in my 11 years here at First Southern. And now I'm saying to you, Jesus asked the very question, what do other people think? 
Now, I want you to understand that Jesus has a purpose and intention in asking this very question, but he does ask the question, what are other people saying about me? Jesus is asking this. And they answer. They say, well, Jesus, some say that you are John the Baptist. What's strange about that? What is strange about them answering this way? They all know that John the Baptist had been beheaded and killed under Herod. So they're saying, well, some people believe that you're John the Baptist. With that, the understanding is some people believe that John the Baptist got his head back and is raised from the dead. Now that may sound strange to you and I, but there are multitudes who were believing that about Jesus at this particular time. Now, some of them said that, that he was Elijah. Elias is the Greek form of this Old Testament Hebrew word, Elijah. And so they say, uh, well, some people believe that you are uh, Elijah. Now, what's strange about that? By the way, Elijah didn't die, remember? How did, how did, how did Elijah exit this planet? On a fiery chariot, right? Absolutely. And so... Maybe that's not so strange because this is not one who's come back to to life. But Elijah hasn't been around for a thousand years by this time, or a long time anyway. And so here they're saying, Elijah's come back. Matter of fact, there's some significance in the verses at the end of Malachi that the last time God speaks in Scripture from the Old Testament, there's 400 years of God not speaking to anybody on earth. And then we come to the New Testament. The last verses of Malachi says that Elijah would come back. And therefore, there were those who maybe come along those lines. Now, the other thing is they say, well, you were some other prophet. Now, I want you to understand that these statements are not, are not derogatory. As a matter of fact, they would be very complimentary towards Jesus. There's nobody saying here, well, you're just some some." Uh, Uh, crazy person they're not accusing Jesus of that they're not trying to put some negative spin on how they're trying to define who Jesus is a matter of fact if anybody else hearing these words said well you're John the Baptist you're Elijah or some other prophet they would say well that's pretty complimentary that's a pretty good thing they would take it as something very positive encouraging something well yeah yeah but there's still a problem with it The fact is this, all of what other people are thinking are absolutely dead wrong. That is not who Jesus is. That is not who this person is. Even though they're complimenting Jesus, there are multitudes today who will think that they are doing something kind towards Christianity when they will say, oh, Jesus was a good prophet. Or they may say, well, Jesus' death was a terrible tragedy. Or they may say, well, Jesus, what happened to him was a miscarriage of justice. They may say all of those things, and it could be positive towards Jesus. They may, they may say, we're not, we're not saying that he was some crazy person. We're, we're trying to attribute some positive aspect of Jesus' life. Here's the problem with that kind of thinking. It's dead wrong. Because you're not saying who Jesus really is. And Jesus' question here is very specific. Who do you think I am? Who do you think I am? Now we can describe people in certain ways, but by not saying some things, it may sort of um, misconstrue some ideas. Let's say someone is visiting from somewhere else in the world and and, and doesn't know American history. And they were to come up to you and they were to say, who was Abraham Lincoln? Now you could answer, well, he was a, a man. That could be your answer, right? It's a true answer, right? It's an accurate answer. That's not a lie whatsoever. But the rest of us who know some American history would say, but if you leave that kind of oppression and that kind of oppression alone, you misconstrued the truth because he was a president of the United States of America. He was instrumental 
in ending slavery in the United States of America. He held the United States of America during a horrible civil war. He was assassinated. We could attribute a lot of different things to Abraham Lincoln that gives us a fuller picture of who Abraham Lincoln is. But just to say, well, he was a man, almost communicates, well, he was just like somebody else. And that's a misunderstanding of who Abraham Lincoln was. Now, think about that. When you say, well, Jesus was a, a good man, is that really accurately describing who Jesus is? So even though some might be accrediting some very wondrous phrases or some very encouraging things about Jesus, they're not communicating the truth because Jesus is more than what these other people are thinking about Jesus. The second thing I want you to see, look here, because in verse 20, Jesus gets very specific and he says, who do you think I am? Who do you think I am? Now, I want you to see this phrase here, who, but whom say ye that I am? This is emphatic. In the Greek, it comes out stronger than even in the English phraseology here. This is getting very personal. This is getting right sort of zeroed in on you and me. And Jesus is saying, who do you think I am? As a matter of fact, this, uh, this passage is, is explained in three of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Or it's in all of those. And in the original Greek, you, if you want to go back and look at this, this Greek, you could, you could see that the Greek word for you is emphatic. And it means a strengthening. It means that it is a forceful question. It is a, it is a question that must be answered. We, we, we kind of maybe can describe it like this. Sometimes we will, we will nonchalantly think, well, what do you think? And we're not like serious about that serious, tell me what you think. But it, we just kind of casually throw out, what do you think? But then other times we want to know specific. We want to know a point blank answer. And we say, what do you think? And we point a finger in their face and we say, I want your thoughts. I need to know what you think. I don't care about what other people think. That's what Jesus is doing here. It's an emphatic question. And he's saying, it doesn't make any difference what other people think. What do you think? And so this is the emphasis that is being placed here. And this is where in our American culture, we need to really grasp this. Because we have all these different kinds of thinking systems in our world. There are some individuals who go to church because their parents are going to church. And they even maybe think in their own minds, I'm a Christian because I've been raised in a Christian home. There are those from other locations who would even accuse the believer as saying, the only reason why you're a Christian is because your parents are Christian. If you was raised somewhere else, you'd be something else. Jesus is cutting through this because Jesus is saying to us by this question, what do you think? It's not about what your parents think. It's not about what your peers think. It's not about what your friends think. It's not about what you've been raised in. It's not about all the other kind of influences on your life. Jesus is cutting through all that and saying, I need to know what do you think? What do you think? And so it's very pointed it's very specific. It's very individual. I know that in some denominations in Christianity, they baptize babies. And there's some uh, association with the belief of the parents being somehow attributed to the baptism of this baby. We do not, as Baptists, we do not baptize babies because we believe in what is called uh, the believer's baptism. This means we ask the individual, what do you think? And you've got to be old enough to be able to answer that. You've got to be old enough to be able to answer this question that Jesus is asking. What do you think I am? Who do you think I am? So this is specific. There's something very narrow in this question. There's not one where we can fake it. We can't pretend about Christianity when we're asked this. You just can't copy somebody else's ideas and adopt them as your own and say, okay, this is who I think Jesus is. Jesus isn't asking that. Because he cuts through all of that and says, I want to know what you think. Who do you say that I am? The third thing I want you to see here 
is Jesus goes on in verse 21 and 22 and describes that there are those who are going to reject who Jesus is. Now, Peter answers the question. Peter, at the end of verse 20, says, the Christ of God. The word Christ is the Greek word that's the equivalent to uh, Messiah. Uh, or, uh, yeah, Messiah in the Old Testament. He's the anointed one. It was the one who was understood as the coming one of God who would provide salvation and deliver us from sin. And so what we find here is Jesus Christ is looking at Peter. Peter answers this question, and Peter absolutely gets it spot on. It's absolutely correct. It is right. In saying that you're the Messiah, it would tie the entire Old Testament to verse 20. Because in the Old Testament, it is where Jesus, where God is speaking to Adam and Eve in the garden in Genesis chapter 3. And says you have sin. The curse of sin is now on every human being. It's on every animal. It's on the planet. It's in the universe. And all the universe has been cursed by this sin. And we know that God gave the promise to Adam and Eve and said, there will be a descendant from you, Eve, who will crush the head of Satan, even though Satan will bite his heel. That's found in verse, or chapter 3 of Genesis. So this is a great, glorious profession and accurate of who Jesus is. You think you ought to just pause here, right, and just sort of celebrate. Let's have a, a celebration that Jesus Christ is the the Messiah, the Christ of God. Jesus doesn't let him do that. As a matter of fact, as soon as it's an accurate confession, as soon as, as soon as Peter states that in verse 21, immediately Jesus says, not everybody's going to understand that or believe that. Now, it's easy to believe things that everybody else believes, but it's a bit harder to grasp and say, I'm going to believe something And then someone come right back with the very words, you're going to be in the minority, not everybody's going to believe this. Makes it a bit harder for us to kind of get excited or jump on board with all of this. Jesus is simply saying, not everybody is going to agree. Now, God is pleased with this answer. God agrees with this answer. This is absolute truth and speaking it, but understand, though you may have the right answer, doesn't mean everybody else is going to be on board with you. Jesus brings that whole concept, that whole idea, right in the midst of this. Jesus is actually communicating to these individuals that are hearing him, the disciples, and saying to them, do you understand this declaration is dangerous? As a matter of fact, we know through history, Christian history, not uh, in the Bible, but outside the Bible, every one of these men die for this confession, except John. And John dies on the Isle of Patmos, suffering the rest of his life. So we know that what Jesus says here, what you are saying is very dangerous. And we know that those that are there that reject Jesus. But Jesus is speaking here and saying, do you understand? It's better to be right than with the majority. It's better to be right with God than all of the rest of the people on this planet. It's true, it's right, it's accurate, but it's not something that people are going to get on board with. It was not something that was going to be declared openly. As a matter of fact, he gives these warnings here about uh, stating this is very dangerous And they kept quiet. Even after the crucifixion and the resurrection, they're huddled in the upper room, terrified of the Romans bursting down the door and arresting all of them and crucifying all of them. But we find that those days after called Pentecost comes and Peter stands in front of vast numbers of individuals, thousands we are told, because 3,000 of them become believers on the day of Pentecost. And Peter declares, the Christ has come, you have crucified him, but he's risen again. He is now the Savior and can deliver you from sin. Now, folks, we live in that day. We live in that day. 
We don't live in the day of Jesus saying, keep your mouth shut, keep quiet, don't tell anybody. People are going to not like what you say. They're going to call you names. They're going to lump you in with some kind of radical movement. They're not going to like you. They want to keep you quiet. They want to shame you. But Jesus is saying to us today, tell the world I am the Christ. I've risen again from the dead. Now, we, we in this room feel safe most of the time. We sing about Jesus. We rejoice about Jesus. We get excited about Jesus. You know, when we sing in Christ alone, I can't help but be jerked in my heart by pains of the words that are spoken in that song. And, and I, just, I just cannot help but be moved it's not easy to feel that when you're out at Walmart and everybody's screaming at you because you forgot your mask. And say, Jesus loves you. You know, that just doesn't have the same effect as it does in this room. But Jesus wants us to stand for him in this day and time. Jesus wants us to say, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. The, fifth, the fourth thing I want you to see here, Jesus must suffer and be killed. Jesus must suffer and be killed. This is what he's saying in verse 22. What is kind of awakening in our thoughts here is imagine the disciples who have just said this wonderful statement that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, and Jesus says that there is going to be something that happens and the very Son of God is going to die. Boy, that just sort of pours water on your enthusiasm, doesn't it? Can you imagine what these disciples are feeling here when they, they say, well, we just declared you're the Son of God and somebody's going to kill you? That just doesn't really seem to fit. But that is the exact truth of what Jesus Christ is telling these individuals. Jesus is more concerned about truth than he is you feeling good. Jesus is more concerned about truth than he is for your happiness. Jesus is more concerned about truth than he is for us feeling safe. Jesus Christ is more concerned about knowing and speaking the truth now, this death is confusing to the disciples. They had his, the, their hopes, of course, was that he was going to set up an earthly kingdom. They even asked this again after his resurrection in, in the first chapter of the book of Acts. And are you come now to, to open your kingdom up, start your kingdom here upon this earth? And, and Jesus says, no, that's not what this is about. And of course, then Jesus ascends into heaven. And so they're confused about this death originally. They began to teach the truth of this, but it's something that ties together the entire Old Testament. As a matter of fact, I know that there are some who read the Old Testament and say, isn't that just sort of a gory detail? I mean, we don't take the book of Leviticus and go into the preschool department, do we, and say, now this is how you eviscerate an animal. It's not really the kind of topics that we want our three-year-old to understand on how to cut an animal up and what parts you should sacrifice and what parts you shouldn't sacrifice. That's really kind of not the forte that we, we typically do. But yet it's something that's very important for us to understand. Because why was Moses instructed to slaughter all these animals? Why had they been doing it from the time of Moses even to the day that Jesus Christ is hanging on a cross and suffering for the wrath of God upon himself, the priests are in the temple slicing the throats of lambs and goats and turtle doves and pigeons. Why? Because the Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. That doesn't set well with us Americans. I've had to butcher chickens. It's not a pleasant thing to do. We don't typically like that. We've raised a generation now that thinks that packaged meat 
at Walmart and Schnucks just comes that way. You know, they're born that way in that package. You know, we just don't know where that meat comes from. But, it, it, you know, it's, it's an animal probably. But, you know, hey, it's just meat. You know, I'm more concerned about how much the hamburgers are going to be cooked, whether you like rare or, you know, well done. I don't know. We don't think about the gruesomeness of this, but God does. God wants us to be repulsed at the gruesomeness, gruesomeness of the, the slaughter of animals. Picture with me that young child who maybe gets that baby lamb. Maybe uh, it doesn't suckle right and they have to maybe help feed the little lamb and raise it. And then dad one day says, well, let's go to Jerusalem. Why, dad? Why are we going to Jerusalem? Well, we got to go to the, to the temple and we got to give our little lamb to the priest. Well, what's the lamb going to do with, I mean, what's the priest going to do with our little lamb? Well, he's going to take a knife and slit his throat. That's just not what the young people would want to hear. You can imagine how devastating this would be. But then that father would have to look at that son and say, Son, daughter, do you understand that we have sinned against a holy, righteous God? And this is what God thinks about our sin. You know why that doesn't set well with Americans today? It's because we think that God just should overlook it just excuse it away just forget about it just god just ignore our sin can't you just play like it didn't happen how many times have we approach god like that god you know i i see the consequences of my sin let's just make it so that there's no consequences there's there's nothing that happens because of my sin now the one who thinks like that is the one that needs to really begin to understand that they do not know and understand the holiness of God. Holiness cannot ignore sin. Holiness can't just say, let's pretend it didn't happen. Because holiness means there's justice and righteousness and perfection. And as soon as holiness says, we'll just ignore sin, it ceases to be perfect and holy and righteous. Therefore, God said from the very beginning of time to Adam and Eve, there is a one who's going to have to come to pay the perfect penalty for our sin. Animals could not do that. You see, animals were cursed too. I mean, wasn't the snake cursed in the Garden of Eden? Absolutely. Animals began to eat each other. Before that, they did not eat each other. The curse brought all of that about. See, the animals were even cursed, but they were sacrificing animals to remember that God was going to send someone to be the perfect example. And this is why when Jesus, the Gospel of Matthew says, Jesus was hanging on the cross, and as soon as he uttered these words, this word in Greek, tetelestai, the curtain in the Holy of Holies was ripped apart from top to bottom. Some have estimated this curtain to be 70 feet tall. That's pretty tall. This curtain behind me is about 40, 40 feet tall. It's a big curtain. Try to open it and close it. You know, it's a heavy curtain. So the, the curtain on the Holy of Holies was 30 feet taller than this curtain behind me. And it was a fabric that was ripped from top to bottom. Can you picture with me God grabbing both sides of that curtain and just tearing it and says, now there's no encumbrance. People can come to me freely. There's no holy of holies versus the holy place that when you have Jesus in your heart, you are the holy place. You are the holy of holies. This is why Jesus says, I must suffer. I must die. And then, of course, he says, I will rise again three days later. Point number five is this. This was done in the name of religion. I want to point your attention to the fact that Jesus calls out some classifications, some positions of individuals who were a part of the religious leadership in Israel. He says specifically that I'm going to be handed over and rejected by the elders, the chief priests, these are the ones doing the sacrifices in the temple, and the scribes. These were the ones who were supposedly holding the scriptures, 
handwritten, remember this is before Gutenberg's press, they handwritten scriptures in Hebrew from Genesis to Malachi, that wasn't in that order, but uh, in that day. And the scribes were to hold the scriptures and make sure they stayed pure and accurate and true and, and nobody could come in and just write in something else. You know, it was, it was to be accurate truth. The exact representation of what the scriptures say. And that was the scribe's job to hold the scriptures in high regard like unto that. So Jesus names these three individuals and say, these are the individuals who are going to be instrumental I mean, others are going to be involved too, but they're going to be instrumental in putting Jesus Christ to death. It is the religious leaders of the day. Let me say kind of a bold statement here, and that is this. Religion will send more people to hell than all the atheists on the planet. Religion will send more people to hell than all the atheists on the planet. Here's something that you have heard, probably. Someone said, well, there's all these different religions, and even inside the religions, there's all these different denominations and groups, and, and how is a person supposed to know which one's right and which one's wrong? I challenged the question from the very beginning, and I would say there are not many religions upon this earth. There are two. There are only two religions upon this planet. There is a religion that says, I must be good enough to have the rewards of heaven. There's that religion. And there's some that's commonality among all of those religions. Whether it's Islam, Islam says you've got to be good enough to go to heaven. In uh, Hindu, uh, you have to be good enough to stop the reincarnation process. In Buddhism, you have to be good enough to stop the reincarnation process. All the cults are saying you've got to be good enough to be acceptable to God. There's a commonality among all of those religions. You've got to work for your salvation. You've got to be good enough to get to wherever you need to go your own. As a matter of fact, in Islam, it specifically states you can't have anybody else do this for you. So it directly contradicts Christianity by saying nobody else can suffer for your sins. That's one of the tenets of Islam. But then there's Christianity. There's Christianity that says this. You cannot get to heaven by your good works. You can never be good enough. You cannot work your way to heaven. You cannot achieve whatever it is to get you to heaven. You cannot do that. You need a Savior who paid the price for your sin. And if you put your faith and trust in Jesus, then that will lead you to heaven. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads right now. And I want you to answer this question within yourself. Honestly, don't just say the word. You know what you're supposed to say. Don't just say it because you know you're supposed to say this. I want you to honestly answer this question. Who is Jesus Christ? Who is Jesus Christ? Every single person in this room is going to answer that question. You may say, well, I'm going to delay that answer. Because I don't know. I don't know is an answer. But it's not the right answer. It might be that you want to honestly say, no, I don't believe in Jesus Christ. I respect your honesty there. But it might be that you say, I want to I talk to somebody. I want to try to find out more. Maybe I just don't know everything there is about this Christianity. And I'd like to find out more about who Jesus is. If that's the case, then might it be that you would come to the pastor or some of the staff and just say, I want to I talk to somebody about what it means to be a Christian. We wouldn't embarrass you. We wouldn't single you out. You could just let me know that out here in the foyer. Maybe during this invitation time, if you feel bold enough to do that, that's okay. But say, I want to talk to you about what it really means to be a Christian. And what I would do or one of the staff would do, which simply we'd go to a side room out here, we'd sit down in some chairs, and we'd open the Bible, 
and just see what the Bible says of who Jesus is and why he came to this earth and died on the cross and rose again three days later. We just simply explain those verses. And still it's going to be left with you. Still it's your choice. Still it's you saying, okay, I declare that Jesus is. And then you fill in the blank there. Might it be that today you want to really challenge yourself to answer this question the way Peter answered it, the way the disciples answered it, the way multitudes have answered it since Jesus Christ's resurrection. We'd love to help you do that. It might be <clears throat> that you are a believer today and say, I know that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior of my life, but God has spoken to you about something else. Maybe you're facing the opposition of Christianity. Maybe you see that the popularity of Christianity has declined quite a bit. Maybe you see individuals who are more forthright in denying Christianity. Maybe you're in school situations, work situations, friendship situations, even maybe in your own very home. You're in conflict with those who are saying Christianity is not real. It's all just a made-up thing. People just invented it. And you see the pressure against the Christianity that you try to hold as a believer. A heart goes out to individuals suffering like that. I, I, I can't say I understand where you're at. I, I was raised in a Christian home. I was taken to church nine months before I was born. I, I was raised in Christianity where it was encouraged and supported in every way, shape, or form. But maybe you're not. But maybe you need a fellowship of people praying for you, encouraging you because of the struggles that you go through as a Christian. Jesus never pulled any punches here. Jesus never said everything's going to be a rose garden from here on, becoming a believer. Jesus never promised that. Jesus said it's going to be tough. I want you to know that up front. Even if you confess the right thing, here it is Jesus says that he's going to die and be raised again and that religious people are going to persecute him. We need to understand that as Christians today. But God has said it's time for us to be bold in a difficult culture, and stand for Jesus Christ. Whatever God has called you to do during this time, we call it the invitation because we invite people to pray here at the altar, pray with me as a pastor, pray with one of the staff. Maybe it is that you want to come and ask some questions. We'll uh, just have a short prayer and then talk afterwards. Maybe it's something else that God's leading you to do. I just call you to do it right now. Let's lift our heads. Let's stand and sing as God leads you. Come.